Hello, everyone, and welcome to this UK Data Service webinar introducing databases. I'm Margarita, and I'm a Senior Communications and Impact Officer. And presenting today is Peter Smythe. He's a research associate working for the UK Data Service at the University of Manchester. Thank you, Margarita. Um, today, thank you, everyone, for coming. Today's webinar is about databases. And what we're going to look at is we're going to consider the definition of a database. We're going to look at why people who use Excel, and quite often people do use Excel as a database, why that may not be quite good enough for what we want to do. Then we'll talk about relational databases with a bit of the history and some examples of, data, of, of using those databases. Then we look at document databases, which I'll explain you, you, by which time you'll, have, you'll understand what a document database is. And then we'll have a quick demo of that and then follow that at the end with a demo of a graph database. So, what is a database? Um, definition taken from the Oxford Uni University Press, a structured set of data held in a computer, especially one that is accessible in many ways. So the, the key points here are, when it says structured, what do, what do we mean by structured? Do we mean it's ordered in some special way or arranged in a special way or what? And then, it doesn't actually tell you anything about how, how it's actually structured. So you, you've, it's open to interpretation, let's say. And certainly different people or different database organizations will have their different views on, on what structured means. And we, we'll come across that later on. Um, accessible. Well, that, that's pretty clear. It has to be in some way searchable. If you're putting data into a database, you need some mechanism for getting the data out again. And the, the whole point of the database is that you put it in in such a way that you can, there are easy ways of searching the data to get it out in certain orders or um, certain ways of grouping the different data types together. And we're going to use a series of different queries in order to do that. And the different database systems that we're going to look at will have different ways of querying the data. So what we've got is it's got to be structured and it's got to be accessible. So pretty clearly, this is not a database. It's unstructured, it's thrown in, and you'd have a great difficulty searching that. You'd have to tip it upside down and unscramble all the papers and so on and so forth. Not a database. Now, on the other hand, some people do use Excel as a simple database. Um, and why, why do they use Excel? It's because the worksheets in Excel are tabular nature, which makes it a very, a very rigid structure. So that ticks one of the boxes. You can join sheets together, join effectively different tables together using the lookup. In fact, database type functions in Excel, built in for many, many years now, which allows you to sum things and count things and so on. These are all things which people will do with a, a, a more conventional database um, and they're already built into Excel. You can also write queries to filter the rows. I'm not just talking about the um, little drop-down query by. You can actually have complex queries, but it is quite tricky to set up. And so this really leads on to sort of the, the disadvantages of, of, the, of Excel. You are limited to a million rows, now, that could be quite a large database in some people's eyes, but in today's um, big data environments, that is becoming increasingly a, a limitation, which people are, are, will quite easily surpass in, in their own collections of data. And then there, there are restrictions on, on these. The VLOOKUP can only return a single column, which is typically not what you want when you try to join tables together. You want multiple columns from multiple tables, potentially. Um, the database function can only return a single value. Uh, functions can only return a single value. Again, not typically what you might want for proper um, analysis of the data, or it represents rather limited analysis of the data. And certainly setting up the queries can be quite uh, complex and not particularly intuitive. Um, so why use a desktop database? Um, I'm, I'm emphasizing the word desktop here because we probably all know that the, you know, a large service around with very large databases, but of course that's outside of everyone's normal reach. So what we're looking at for to use a desktop database is that the size of the data. Is it too big to fit in the likes of Excel or, or Stata or SPSS, the, the sorts of tools that you might commonly um, associate with doing analysis with? 
um, there's a convenience of the desktop system. You've already using your desktop or your, or your laptop for your ord ordinary everyday work. So having all of your data in there as opposed to in a, some external server obviously has some benefits, convenience if nothing else. Oops. Um, there's the flexibility in collecting and persisting the data. What I mean here is that um, you're not necessarily going to come across all of your data in one file, in one fell swoop, and there it is. Over the, the period of your research, you may be adding to your data in, in a regular manner or even an irregular manner, but you want to some way of keeping it all together, um, making sure you don't lose the bits that you've got, and just being able to gradually add to the data to build up a larger um, corpus of information or of data. And then we've got the the key selling points of databases, the flexibility that you, it's going to give you in query and analysis. So what I'm going to show you now is um, a couple of or a slide which I used in an earlier webinar on basically on Hadoop when we were talking about the growing and shrinking of data. I'm just going to whiz through all the little bits in here and then describe it at the end. Um, basically, what we have here is on the, at the top, we have tweets which we're going to grow the tweets, so the amount of data involved in these tweets, right up to the point down here where the tweets, the, or the volume of data you've collected is so large that you can't conveniently process it in your desktop applications. So again, we're talking about the SPSs and, and the starters. Um, and on the bottom half, we're assuming you had a large set of data and you may have decreased it. It's really, the point about this is if we're growing data, it gets to the point where you can't use your normal desktop application and you at the time, we suggested you use a big data system like Hadoop or whatever. So what we've got today is a slightly modified version of this, um, this slide, which works very much the same way as we build the data up. And it's really the building of data up that we're, we're particularly interested in in this session, because as I say, if it's already too big, then it's too big. Um, and here, instead of having a single line at 5 gigabytes, we've got a line at 5 gigabytes and a line at about, say, 25 gigabytes. And we're saying desktop applications, as we did before. We've got the big data environment, as we did before. But this middle section is potentially amenable to a, de a desktop database, data which is too big for your normal desktop applications. It's perhaps too small, well, it wouldn't be too small, but it's inconvenient to have to go to um, a big data environment. So in this little gray area down here, we have the potential for using a desktop database. And that's what we're going to consider your options for using desktop databases in the rest of this webinar. So four main types of databases. We're not going to look at all of them, but what we have are the relational databases, which is by far the majority of them, um, document databases, graph databases, and wide, what, what, are, what are called wide column stores. And we won't be really considering wide column stores. We'll look at relational databases, we'll look at document databases, and we'll look at graph databases, or a graph database. And so just a brief description of what these entail. Um, the relation ones, as I say, predominate by a long way. Data is held in tables, and the relationships are defined between the tables to, so, to enable you to join the tables. In a document database, and so there's the wide common store database as well, to some extent, they use storage architectures which are designed to overcome limitations and scalability problems of relational databases. And since um, big data sources have become available, i.e. The, the, the volumes of data are increasing, then these are gaining popularity. And then the graph databases, um, these are designed to optimize specific types of queries. This is where you're more interested in the relationship between terms or items in tables than actual attributes of the items. So the, the, the obvious example I always think of is in social networks like um, Twitter and Facebook and what have you, when you have followers and followers have followers and you want to know who follows who, follows who, and so on and so forth. 
So there's a lot of, um, of research type questions which you can pose which fall into this category and by far um, the most efficient databases for answering those kind of questions of the data would be a graph database rather than a simple relational database. Um, just to, to give you some background, there is a site um, here, dbengines.com ranking, which will actually show you on a monthly basis, I'm not sure why they do monthly, all of the various databases in use and how popular they are. So you can see from, from this table, um, as I was saying, the top, the highest ones, I don't know what the score actually is, so these are just relative positions if you like, but you can see the top three all relational databases. MongoDB, which we'll be looking at, is the highest non-relational one, which is a document database. And then we've got Cassandra, which is a wild, wide column store. And then, not very much further down, um, we have Neo4j, which I think is the top rated graph database. And you can go through this table and look at all the different types of databases you, you can get. Most of them are relational ones. There are a, a few which have things like search engines, um, Solar is probably a search engine. Some of them are in fact more um, specifically tasked databases as opposed to the ones at the top here and all the ones that we're looking at, which are far more general use within that the, the specific area that, uh, uh, of data that we're going to talk about. Um, so, um, and just to, to summarize that table, um, I've got here a table of the various databases. And I've listed these because these are all, all freely available. You can load all of these onto your desktop if you like. Um, I'm not sure if Cassandra would work too well on the desktop, but certainly um, the examples I'm going to show you from MySQL, uh, Neo4j, and MongoDB, they're all loaded on my desktop, and that's where I'm going to run the, the queries from. And you can, if you go to these sites, you can find instructions for downloading them, installing them, and tutorials on how to use them if you, if you need more information on that. So let's go on to the relational model, and we'll consider why do we have it, what's it good for, pros and cons, and what do we mean by relational? I'm going to try and answer those questions, not necessarily in that order, but over the next few slides. So let's have a look at a bit of the history. The, the term relational, first used by EF Cod in 1970, um, a relational model of data for large shared data banks. And um, although it's not wasn't necessarily the main reason for developing relational database, it should be that at the time computer storage was very expensive, that is disk storage, where you store your data, it was very expensive. And one of the advantages of the relational model is that it could be very efficient when you're storing data because it didn't, it only stored each item of data once as opposed to repeating the same data across different records for different reasons. And just to, to prove the point or illustrate the point of how expensive storage was, back this graph here, if, if you go back to 1980, the cost of storage $193,000 per gigabyte. This is a log scale on the y-axis and by 2014 it dropped to 3 cents a gigabyte. So it gives you a, a, an idea of how the, not, well obviously the cost has come down so dramatically, but you can imagine that the, the priority in conserving and being efficient with data storage has has also waned in, in, in that time as well. Back in 1980, every byte you could save was was money saved money in the bank, whereas when you get down to three cents um, a gigabyte, frankly, you can store anything you like and just keep it there. It, it's costing you virtually nothing to store the data, and that's that's not only affects the relational model and why that was developed, but it also goes somewhere to explaining why when we talk about the the document stores and the MongoDBs why we don't care that there seems to be a lot of duplication in the information as we come to it. So uh, let's look at a relational model, how it worked. Um, 
let's imagine I've got some information on a household here. I've got various items about the household. This is just a, an identifier, address, postcode. We've got people who live in this household. We've got something about the house itself, number of rooms. Um, we've got the type of house construction, you know, brick, semi-detached, that sort of thing. Now, if you wanted to create that, put that into a table, what you would end up with is something like this. And you can see from this, this is all of the same information laid out in the table, as you commonly see. But the point about it is, this section here and this section at the end, where we're talking about the house and not the people who live in the house, it's effectively being repeated for each member of the household, which means it's just wasted space, it's repeated information. And back in 1980, that would be very much a no-no. You can't afford to do that sort of thing. So what the relation and model does is it breaks it down into sets of, of tables and where each table is linked to the next table or, or another table by some common key. So, oh, household ID here is the same as the H household ID here, and that's what they're joined on. So you can use these joins to reconstruct that full table if you wanted to, but the advantage is that if you don't need all of the information, well, not, not, not only well, there's, there's two advantages. One is that when you split it up into tables, the information about the house itself only has to get stored once, because all of these, I, all of the five persons, refer to the same set of information about the house, so it's only stored once. The other advantage is that, um, or another advantage is that if you were just interested in, say, perhaps um, names and ad or addresses. Or, or even information about the types of builds of houses, then you don't have to touch the other tables. So you're going to restrict how you access the data. You're going to access less data, therefore it's going to be more efficient. So let's just go through some of the in more advantages in more detail. We've got it's only stored once. It's certainly efficient for well-known and structured data. That's data where you know in advance the column names, if you like, of what it is you want to store, and you know that when you get a new observation, all of those fields are going to be there, or, or potentially all of those fields are going to be there, and you can just put another another row in your table to, to accommodate that. Um, querying tabular or structured data like this is very well understood and we have the structured query language SQL which is almost universal for querying um, structured tables like this and it's, it's relatively easy to learn and of course you can use it on any relational database. Um, the other advantage is they all operate on a system called schema on write and what this allows for is data checking when you're loading the data. Because scheme on write means you've got to have defined your table definition in advance of putting any data into it, when you do get around to putting the data into it, you can do lots of checks. Like if, if I said this, this, this column has got to hold an integer and I try to give it um, a, an address, a house address, then I know something's wrong. And there are various other things you can say, well, this, this column can't be blank. If, if someone tries to put an empty value in there, then I know there's something wrong with that observation at that time, as opposed to finding out later on when you do um, EDA on data and so on and so forth. So it can be an advantage when you're trying to do that. And it makes for, certainly makes for cleaner data when you've loaded it. Uh, there are disadvantages, of course. Um, multiple tables increases the loading time, because if you now take a single observation, you may have to split the data in that across several tables, or four tables as we had in the example before, and that obviously takes a bit more time to actually load the data. Perhaps that's not something that's a concern, perhaps it is. Uh, vertical scaling is a problem. Um, this isn't really relevant to our desktop situation because your desktop is your desktop is your desktop. But in larger server environments, the problem with relational databases is that if you want to make them bigger and faster, you've got to house them in bigger and faster server boxes. And I guess a limit to how, how well you can do that. 
On the other systems that we look at, um, because you can s scale um, horizontally, i.e. you just add new servers, it makes them a lot more scalable in the long term. But like I say, for, for our discussion today, it's not really relevant because we're just sticking to our one despot, despot, desktop anyway. Um, we've got the scheme and write, uh, just to explain, that's you, you you can't deal with unstructured data. Because you've got to predefine what your table A is and all the columns in your table, you can't have data which comes along which has a new column in it or the columns are in the wrong order. So that can make it, make it very difficult to deal with unstructured data sources and that is increasingly what we tend to find in the modern world with all of the various data sources coming from um, the web, web APIs and so on and so forth. So it does, does have a bit of a restriction there. So um, I'm just going to show you a little demo of a relational database. Well, what if I find the system? Let me this. Like I said, you can get this from the internet, you can download it, and it, um, it's all free. It comes with a nice um, user interface. Um, I'm just to log into. Okay, and what I've got here, I've, got, I've just installed um, a few little tables down here. And I just want to emphasize a couple of things on these very quick examples. What I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to create a table called City2. And I've got five columns in it, ID, name, country code, dis district, and population. And you can see when I'm defining these column names, in addition to the column names, I'm saying what kind of information I, I, I'm using, the type of the information. So here I'm saying it's an integer which has up to 11 um, digits in it. Here I've got a character up to 35 digits in it. Other things I'm saying, I'm saying not null, i.e. you cannot load a, a record into this table if the country code is missing. The other thing I can do is I can give default values. So I can say it's not null, but should you actually get something which A is a null, you can set it to zero instead, or set it to space instead, or null instead. But again, you, you have to know that's been done, because that's not the same. You're effectively altering your data if you start doing that when you put it in. So you have to, be, you have to think it through before you actually start do, setting these tables up and know what your data is going to look at, look like. So having um, create, let me just create this table, city2, um, and I'll show that. You can see city2, you can expand city2 and see all the columns I've just created and so forth. There's no, obviously no data in this at the moment, um, which I can verify by, if I run this simple select statement, select everything from city2, and there's nothing in there, which is what we expect. I've just created it. If I insert some data into City2 with this statement here, I'm just going to insert these three rows at the bottom, very simple rows, um, and then we'll be able to look at it again. In, in practice, this isn't very practical loading data this way. What you would normally do is bulk load the data using statements like this, load data from a, a file and into the into the table. But the point is you can only do that if you have already defined the table. The table must be defined first in, a, in these um, relational databases. So if, um, having inserted my table, I can, I can run the queries again. So if I run that one again, I've now got my three rows in there. Um, I've got a couple of other queries here based on my other tables, the city, country, and country language. And here I can actually do an aggregation of the data. So here I'm looking for the head of state from the country table, and I want to know how many countries the head of state is head of state for. And if I run that, we find that Elizabeth II is head of state in 35 different countries. 
Um, if I run this one here, I'm joining two tables together. So I'm joining the city table here, and I'm joining the country table together. And these um, fields at the top are the two. I want two from city, and I want two from country. And if I run that, I get the results out there. Okay. So uh, writing the queries on a relational database can be very um, quite straightforward and simple. So now back to the slides. Um, let's see. Okay, so moving on now to the document database. Um, again, same set of questions. What do we have it for? Is it good? Pros, cons? What's meant by document? That's a bit different. So what we have, first thing, what it's not. A document is not a PDF or a Word document. It's a semi. It's a, something which is contains semi-structured data. What does semi-structured mean? Well, structured in that every data item in the document, um, and a document in this sense you would think of in terms of a record or a single observation or something like that, um, has a name associated with it. And it's semi in that different documents in the same collection of documents, i.e. say, say um, you've got observations from a, a survey, that, so the survey is the collection and each individual response is one observation, they don't all necessarily have to have the same set of answers in them or the same set of questions which have been answered in them. Um, Semi-structured data, data is almost invariably displayed in or provided in JSON format. And this is a, um, a data format and it's certainly the most popular in, in for semi-structured data. And virtually anything that you download from a web-based API will be in JSON format or you'll be able to get it in a JSON format. So the idea is that we're looking for something that can eff efficiently process this kind of data. And just to show you what it looks like, here's an example of some data formatted in JSON. So everything between the curly brackets is a single record or observation or document. And it's got three items in it. It's got a name which has a value of Manchester, postcode, so on, established, so on. All, all of the, it's always in the format of some kind of key name here and the value for that key name. And you can see, I mean, it's, it's probably quite clear that when you get around to searching or querying this type of information, if you say name equals something, it's going to come back and say Manchester. You don't actually do it quite like that. So. Um, as we, the semi-structured nature means that it's, it can be difficult to store in tables and the reason that is is because not all of the fields need to be in each document. In a sense that's not a great problem if you actually knew what all of the fields possibly could be and the reality is you don't know that and even if you did it could mean for, for, make for very sparsely populated tables um, and of course the fields don't have to be in the same order. So here's a little example of two, there's two um, uh, documents here. The first one has um, three, three values, three um, column or three um, items, data items in it. It's got ID, name and telephone number. The second one, which is in the same collection, has the name and ID in different order and it's also got email, which happens to have two values in it and it's got a mobile number which the other one didn't have. So, but they're both perfectly valid to be stored as part of the same collections. Um, and you can see from that, why it's almost impossible to create a, a schema of this in advance. And because of this, this when you're accessing these, this kind of data, it's referred to as schema on read. Schema is just the way you define the, the definition of the table in the relational sense. So it's schema on read because you can't do schema on write as we did before because that requires you to have written the table definition before you load the data. We can't do that here. So we have schema on read where you just store all of the data as it comes in, as the records come in, and then when you need to search the data, then you start saying, oh, well, I need something which has an ID in it, and I need something which has a mobile number in it. And then when you do the search, you only get records which have those, those fields in them. 
Okay. Oops. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk specifically about MongoDB. Um, or show the examples in MongoDB, um, and they don't use SQL to query the data. Um, when you install MongoDB, you get a simple shell, which you can use to query the data. The bad news is shell requires you to know JavaScript, really, to make that work effectively. And it's a little black and white screen. It's not really very, very pleasant to use. Uh, but as an alternative, if you've got a program, if you're used to programming environments like Python or R, they both have packages which allow you to interface to MongoDB directly. And so, instead of writing your um, queries in this JavaScript type shell, you can write it in in Python using Python-like constructs. And that is is what we're going to have a look at in a minute. Um, but this type of querying, because it's not SQL, the querying can make accessing the data in these kind of databases a bit more complex. It's, complex. Um, it's, it's more like programming than simple querying. Okay, so we'll just have a little look at what some of these queries can look like in MongoDB, uh, which I think I've got up here. <coughs> so what we have here is um, just a Jupyter notebook in which I've written some Python. Um, some of this is very similar to what we showed in the MongoDB webinar a few months ago. So all I'm going to do is just quickly run these. That first one just sets up the connection into MongoDB, and I've told it what collection I'm going to use, and it's a collection called Brexit, which is actually a series of tweets I collected just before the referendum in June. And if you want to know what a tweet looks like, I can say, show me one from this collection. And as you can see, a tweet contains an awful lot of, um, well, probably the majority of quite useless information. But somewhere in there, we have the text of what someone was actually saying and various other things. Um, how, many, how many tweets did I collect? 55,547. What if I wanted to know, find all of, how many count, how many tweets were there where the geo field was not equal to none? Now, the geo field is things like GPS information, um, longitude and latitude, i.e. where the, the tweet was sent from. And if I run that, I've got only got 53 out of my 55,000. And that's about 0.1%, which is apparently typical for what everyone says is the number of tweets which have geo information in there. So having got that far, if I now, within this 53 tweets, I'm going to look for um, a location of the user in a place called Alrissey, which is about 30 miles north of London. And instead of getting the full tweet back, as I did up here, what I'm saying here is I only want you to show me the, the, user, the ID of the user the location of the user, and the, the geo information of that user. And if I run that, what I get back is, again, this is very JSON-like in the structure, which is handy for Python, because Python can handle JSON very easily. And I've got coordinates, so I know where this tweet was sent from. I already knew that was all going to be the same, obviously. And I've also got the ID of that particular user who sent the tweets. So I can do the same sort of querying type analysis in Python as I, I was able to do in SQL, but it, it is a little bit more involved, um, and the query language itself is it's probably just as powerful, um, but it, it, it's a bit of a learning curve, perhaps. So the last thing I wanted to show you is the graphic database. For this we're going to use Neo4j, which again, if you go to the, the website, which I've given you the link for, you can download it and install it. It'll install on your PC quite happily. Um, and what you get is a simple movies database. That's what we're going to use for these examples here. Um, and it also comes with quite um, a few tutorials on how you can um, load your own databases and get um, information from there. So let's just have a quick look at the MongoDB, uh, a big button, the Neo4j. Oops, that's not the one I wanted. Um, this one here, and uh, we've got Neo4j. I'll just make this big. 
And when you load up Neo 4J, um, this is pretty well the front screen that you get when it's, it's loaded up. And if I click on the database there, and I click on this little asterisk here, it will immediately run this query. So it's saying match any number, return anything with 25. So what it's doing in the background, the, the data is organized into um, various th things called nodes and relationships and properties which are related to the nodes. So what I'm getting on this simple query, and remember this is a movies database, it's shown me um, a, a film here and which is a node and then it's got actors or people if you like um, person which are also nodes and the relationship between the two is written in here so acted in most of these are acted in and they're all acted in I think um, down here we've got a more complex one with a few films in and so you can use this to see that the relationships between who that well this guy here person I've never heard of clearly um, a director I suppose um, this person seems to have acted in th these three films and so on and so forth it's a nice graphical in interface but it's very easy to get it um, so crowded that you can't actually see much in it if I change that to 250 up here and run that then it gets really that's just a little bit too much for you to do anything useful in. but you don't, you're not restricted to just using the, using the graph like that you can um, actually get Run other other queries. Um, oops, let me just bring it up again. Yeah, so I've, I've got a few other queries here. Um, I'll just run a couple of them. And again, you can see from you can sort of see from here what we're looking for here. We're finding a person which we're calling people, that's just a variable name, it, what it related to this movie Cloud Atlas and we want to know who was related, you know, what the relationship is. So if, if I run that, what I get is for Cloud Atlas, everything for Cloud Atlas, I've got the direct, direct it's the multiple directors, we've got the producer, the road and so on and so forth. You can actually have this in, in bit of a table information as well if you like and if you really want you can have it return to you in JSON no surprise there really and again um, Neo4j and MySQL um, both have interfaces to both Python and R so you can do this entirely programma programmatically if, if you want to I've just got one last query I'm going to run uh, because this possibly demonstrates um, why um, graphical databases are considered so powerful. Um, what I'm going to do is, what I'm looking for here is a, any connection between Kevin Bacon and Meg Ryan. They're both people, um, this little asterisk in here says I don't care how many hops you've got to go through, how many different nodes you have to go to, find me a connection between Kevin Bacon and Meg Ryan and this is all wrapped up in a single um, um, function here called shortest path so it's actually only going to return one, it may find multiple connections but it's only going to find the one which is the shortest path connection and if I run that and look at the little graph because that's easier you can see that the connection is that Meg Ryan acted in Joe versus the volcano. Tom Hanks also acted in that, and Tom Hanks also acted in Apollo 13, and Kevin Bacon acted in Apollo 13. So you can use this to find connections between um, different people, and that, that's a um, depending on the, the depth, uh, how, how many links we need might have to go through here. That becomes incredibly inefficient in a relational database, and this is where graphic databases are so so very quick and useful. So, in summary, what we have is the size of your data may be enough to make you want to decide make you decide on using a desktop database. So it's in that middle ground between I can't use my normal stata or whatever, I don't really want to go into a big data environment or a server environment, so I'll try and put it on my desktop. Um, but it's not the only thing you need to consider. Um, you want to know how you're collecting the data over time and how it's going to build up and whether it's going to build up into anything big enough. 
um, you want to know the structure of the data because some data is going to be more suited to a relational database, some data is going to be more suited to um, a, a document type database like MongoDB if you're not sure of the structure, if it's semi-structured data. Um, how do you intend to use the data? Now, what I'm getting at here is that if you were to, there are ways of collecting um, Twitter data in, in the likes of R. R has a package for collecting Twitter data. But what it does is it will automatically, when it collects the data, instead of giving you that long list of, 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 um, of items which I, I showed you in that Python demonstration, in that uh, MongoDB demonstration, it will actually select a set of fields which it is going to save. And it will actually give you the option of saving them into, into a relational database because, because it's picked the fields in advance there's no problem with storing them in a relational table because it already knows what those fields are going to be. That's fine if that's what you if you know you're just going to use those fields. But if on the other hand you're going to have to um, you might want to go back and use different fields, then you may have to consider um, store the whole the whole of the tweet, the raw data. And and that may influence how you use it. So you have to be careful about that. Um, can you clean the stru and structure the data as you collect it? So that's, that's what I've just been talking about effectively. This is what this um, the R Twitter package does. It decides for you what it's going to save and clean and keep, and keep collected. If you don't, if you can't do that in advance, um, you may have to keep all of the data just in case. So again, in our Twitter example, that would be the full tweet. And again, there are packages in Python which will do that. It will record the data and you can store it straight into MongoDB and it will store it as a full all of the tweets data. And then you can process it in, in the way that we showed. Okay, so things, things to consider before you um, choose your database, not only deciding whether you want to use a database or not. Okay, any questions? Thank you everyone for attending. I hope you did find it useful and interesting. And uh, have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.